So, um, climate finance and natural climate solutions um, for you guys. So, vision and opportunity. Our guiding vision behind this work really is to build, and as I've said, is to build and deploy a new financial pathway to drive conservation and restoration based on the climate value achieved. Um, and I'm often pretty unapologetic about the focus on, on building this new tool. There's lots of people um, working, though we could still use a lot more, there's lots of people working on the different ways to, existing ways to protect landscapes, make it a park, try to get government funding, try to buy it, um, use conservation dollars. Um, and I think that's amazing. I hugely support all that. Um, and this is meant to be an additional tool. Um, the compelling opportunity really is to enable greater levels of community control, guardianship, and economic self-determination through the use of carbon offsets and climate finance pathways. So we're not doing this just for the fun of creating a new system. Um, we actually want to um, get good things, get some good things done. Um, and our big question really is, can communities use carbon offsets and climate finance to fund better forest management of their landscapes? Oops. So the role of natural climate solutions, and it's been neat to have sort of a, a new name termed for this space and this concept. And there's a couple different ones that people are using, nature-based solutions, natural climate solutions, nature-based climate solutions. Um, and it's a real joy as somebody who's been working in this space for a long time to see the, the theme arcing back to a focus on nature. And um, once again, this is not meant to be exclusionary in the scope of the work that people are doing around the world um, and, and in Canada and around the space. Um, but I feel really strongly that a focus on natural climate solutions um, can really get us a lot farther in the climate fight um, that has been largely ignored as a specific tool for addressing climate change. Um, and, and that there's, there has built up a misunderstanding and some elements of mistrust of this space, even within the environmental movement um, and with the focus on clean energy. Um, and some of that's warranted, but most of it I would say is not. Um, and, and where people are seeing problems with their facets of it, that's an invitation to go in, fix it, work harder on that rather than just throw it away. Um, because nature, along with its climate benefit, does provide a whole critical, irreplaceable value of plants, animals, benefits to human and all of the earth. Like when people say by, directly or um, by extension, we should ignore natural climate solutions. I'm like, that's not a very fun world to live in um, if, if these things aren't taken care of as well. Um, and one of the benefits um, of natural climate solutions is the uptake and support. Let me know if I'm getting choppy or anything. Um, uh, so there are benefits to climate. Um, and we're finding that, that we can find markets for that. We also have benefits to biodiversity, water, and community benefits. And we focus in our carbon market work and then this work to also have tools to quantify and communicate these because um, A, that helps us develop better projects where we have these outcomes and B, uh, it helps tell the story and communicate the benefits to people who may want to support it. One of my big tools in explaining like why nature um, comes from a report from around the year 2000, it was like 1998 um, that the UN put out and a full third of human made greenhouse gas emissions between industrial revolutions, so like 1850s and the year 2000 were caused by land use change, primarily deforestation. And today that continues to be around 20% per year. Um, and so that's a huge issue. It also artificially cuts the timeline off at the industrial revolution because if you went all the way back, farther back, um, you would see that most of those excess emissions have been landscape based. Um, and there's some recent findings, I think um, Nature United and the Nature Conservancy have been doing really neat work in finding that a third of the cost effective emission reductions achievable worldwide between now and 2030 are from natural climate solutions. Um, so you can't really solve the problem without nature. Um, and another uh, 
hair to split finely is that our work isn't to commodify nature, um, but it is to commodify the task of helping nature. So we're not saying, you know, this tree is worth this much money um, or this natural landscape is worth this much money. It's no, we can derive that much money from the improvement to enable this good work. There are, are lots of different types of natural climate solutions and at, at some level they don't need explanation, but I find sometimes it's helpful to look into the different classes or strata um, of project types that we look at from a carbon market um, point of view and kind of in the um, contemporary discussion around what is a natural climate solution. Uh, so we have forests, um, restoration, afforestation, reforestation. Um, so this is, putting forests and putting forests back on the landscape and regenerating good things there. And that has the function of getting more carbon out of the atmosphere. Then there's improved forest management. Well, I'll go actually to conservation. So conservation is also kind of um, straightforward to imagine. Um, we are protecting standing forests. Um, we're keeping more forests on the landscape. We're keeping them from getting cut down and we're fundamentally keeping a carbon sink from being released to the atmosphere. Um, and that's kind of conceptually similar to keeping oil in the ground. It's different because it's lithosphere and atmosphere, um, but keeping, not burning fossil fuel, for example, keeping it that carbon sequestered um, the way it was is kind of a similar concept there. Now, improved forest management, I think, is um, one of the ones that's a little less um, conceptually obvious. Um, and I think it's it's really where a lot of, I've chosen to focus on my work. Um, so the whole concept that um, it may not always be a fit to put a line around a landscape, To conserve it. Um, we're just considering that can be because the land is owned or the tenure is owned by um, logging interests. Um, it also may be, and that can be a whole range of things, including that maybe the local communities are gaining good benefit out of managing their forest um, and with a renewed value substitute for some of the values that are being impacted by Sorry, Joseph, I, I, I don't think we can hear you super well. Is something going wrong with your way? Um, and it's also important to remember that given that the current auto on, but um oops, that's not the right way to do that. Um how is that? Is that better? Um, yes. Yeah. Yep. Let's just. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, I'm also just going to see. Uh, Thirty seconds, actually. Maybe everyone just turn their video off. It's probably on my end. Um, I have gigabit internet. Um, maybe that'll help. I have gigabit internet, but ethernet rather. Um, but it attenuates in our small home pretty quickly through the walls because it's running on the five megahertz rather than the 2.4. Anyway, um, can you hear me okay right now? Yeah. Great. Um, so moving on from improved forest management, um, there's grasslands and soils. Um, and we talk about improved land management, no-till regenerative agriculture, and then also land and soil conservation, straight up protection of, of grasslands. I have not done as much of a focus on grasslands and soils um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, there, there is really neat work to be done there, um, but I just see such a big win available in forestry. Um, and so I've been focusing on that. Um, there is a really the interesting case of wetlands, peatlands, and permafrost, um, and be it resolved that there are incredible volumes of carbon stored in these landscapes. Um, one of the issues for using carbon finance to address them is that um, there's not, a, in a lot of cases, it's not human direct activity 
that is disturbing these or disturbing them on a, on a scale where there's a massive carbon release. Um, so AKA there's limited direct control that we have over it. So it's difficult to say, hey, we're gonna make a management change, which will directly lead to carbon benefit. Um, I'll do this one. I'll probably skip over a few slides, but I just wanted to talk a bit about the role of a carbon offset. Um, and I'm happy to send this um, uh, presentation to anybody um, if, if that's valuable as well and can answer questions in the future. Um, but carbon offsets are, are valuable because they're a proactive project-based emission reduction that gets or keeps carbon out of the atmosphere. There's many types, we've kind of talked about them, but one of the important factors is that they're outside of the cap sector. Probably won't go into that today, um, but when you have a situation like a cap and trade system, which is my preferred um, way for humans to organize themselves to reduce emissions year over year till we get to where we need to be, um, any of the sectors that are captured under the cap um, like the fossil fuel sector, electricity generation, industrials, um, they're already having an impetus to reduce their emissions because of the cap getting deeper and deeper every year, like so smaller and smaller. Um, and so you can't generate offsets from those sectors, um, but where forestry and forest carbon and landscape carbon haven't been capped or included in um, we need to have lower and lower emissions of those from each year. That's where you can have this proactive tool where um, you can feed the supply of emission reduction outcomes into the country or the region's demand by having the tool of carbon offsets. And that's a little arcane, um, but uh, an important note. And really conceptually we're doing this because it's a way to drive new investment into improving emission reduction outcomes um, and i also really like it because it democratizes engagement and climate action um, it fills that gap between personal actions and public policy and then all the other folks doing stuff right so if you are riding your bicycle to school or work um, and you're making conscious eating choices and recycling and stuff um, this is really good but you kind of realize that it's not a match to your own, may not be a match to your own personal desire to address climate change. Um, and so in some cases, going and working on these kind of projects is, is awesome and really fun, but not everybody can spend their time doing that. So by buying offsets, you're actually funding um, people to go out and, and do that work. And um, it also, makes it so that all the chips aren't held by the large emitters. So right now, um, a lot of the time, if you put regulation on or a cap and trade or a carbon tax, um, it appropriately penalizes the large emitters if you're doing it right. But there's a perverse aspect, which is that they also then control what, what type of activities are chosen to drive emissions down. Um, and so this is a way to, to put this back into the hands of smaller projects, into the hands of communities um, to, to drive emission reductions. Um, I'll point out that all offsets systems in the world now allow forest carbon offsets, and that took some fighting and some good work and really demonstration of excellent projects, um, and really happy that we're there right now. And finally, I, I, it's a little bit geeky, but I say offsets are a tool to connect emission reduction supply and demand. So there's so many opportunities around the world to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, but in most cases, you can only do that if there's a way to insert money into that system. Um, and really what you do by connecting the demand for those emission reductions with the supply or the ability to do it. And so offsets fundamentally are a tool to that, which I find kind of neat. Um, so these are some of the fundamentals of an offset. I won't dig into them, um, but they're real, quantifiable, additional, permanent, and verified. Um, these are also some more of the um, pieces of the puzzle around assessing um, carbon offsets and quantifying the, the number from any specific project. Um, and so we do a baseline case, which is what would the carbon emissions and the carbon reality be if we don't do anything? Um, and then the project case is if we go and implement a project, um, what is the improvement of those carbon emission reduction outcomes? And we subtract one from the other and we see, okay, um, by doing this project, we're getting this benefit. 
leakage is if some of that benefit, say you're protecting a forest um, and there's still a demand for those forest products, there will be some harvest somewhere else. Um, and there's been a lot of work done on tools to figure out that amount. So it's not often that all of this, that demand will go somewhere else, but some will. And so we have to net that down or remove that from the carbon credits that we claim. Um, and we also do a net down or a reduction of, of credits for non-permanence. So where there's a risk of fire um, or other intended, unintended reversals, um, we also will either just simply not credit that proportion um, or sometimes it's credited but put into a buffer account or a self-insurance account that can get drawn down as the risk decreases. Um, these are some ways to think about offsets and think about the value parameters of them standard, sector, where they're from, when they were made. Um, and a recommendation I have if you're developing an offset project is you wanna find an anchor tenant, as I say it, or a, or a major buyer um, that you have some security that you're gonna be able to sell these credits once you make them because they take a lot of time and money to make often. Um, there is a federal offset system under development right now. It's got kicked back a little bit from COVID. Um, but the feds are working on a system to allow Canadians to generate carbon offsets um, from a variety of different sectors, including forests. Um, and that will plug into the demand being created by their output-based pricing system. It's sort of an intensity-based cap and trade that they've created for large emitters in the provinces and territories that haven't set up their own system and that are hence, we hear about it as the carbon tax. So I think in Ontario now, um, there's a carbon tax because the current government got rid of the cap and trade system, but the federal government said, no, you still are going to be, um, have a carbon price in your jurisdiction, which is great. And they use a carbon tax for everyday people and they have this open, based pricing system for large emitters. Um, and there's a number of different ways to comply with that, um, including buying offsets. Um, the last major um, concept that I really wanted to share with you um, is a, a whole nother um, tool, a whole nother sort of set of um, principles that we're trying to create into a funding mechanism for improvements on the landscape in Canada. Um, and I'm, I'm a big long-term offset proponent, as you might have gathered from this call. Um, but from that, I also see that there are a lot of situations where there's provable emission reduction outcomes um, that we can achieve from the forests, um, but that for one reason or another can't be issued as a carbon offset or feasibly developed through that system. And so we are um, building up this new concept um, to enable the funding of those kinds of projects. Um, it really all pivots off of a, a change to how Canada is doing it, its um, carbon inventory and its sort of carbon footprint towards the Paris Agreement. Um, it's a bit geeky and it's, it's very geeky and it's still not even fully hammered, fully comprehensible by anybody, I think, including myself. Um, but basically, um, Canada's now including the impact of direct human forest management on our carbon footprint. Um, and so we realize that if this is the case, that means that now for the first time, um, outside of the offset realm, if we can reduce emissions um, from the managed landscapes in Canada, we get Canada closer to meeting its Paris commitment, which means then theoretically that has a dollar value to a Canadian government that was going to have to implement the taxes and regulations and direct investment in Canada and potentially international credit purchases or just not meet its targets, um, now we can create a tool to invest in forests and get us closer to that target. And so upon realizing that that's something that could happen, but it needed a, a, a program and some architecture to do it, we set out to, to build that, um, which has been a really amazing ride over the last year. Um, it's also a really good fit. It's a really good fit in general for um, the zeitgeist for the spirit of the times. And we're actually seeing that it could be really valuable in a COVID recovery investment type situation where the federal government is looking for how it itself can support recovery and how it can support provinces and territories to make investments um, that help us 
build back better. Um, and so we're kind of hard at work right now on that. Can I ask a question uh, about that point? Uh, yes, uh, it, I know it's you mentioned that it's geeky and hard to uh, difficult to explain. Is there a, a sample project that you that you might be able to explain that would work under this um, incentive structure, but not under a typical cap and trade incentive structure? Absolutely. Um, so the um, yeah, I think the only part that's really like geeky is is how it. Well, it's all kind of geeky, but the spot that I was speaking to as being difficult is how it actually uh, engages with the national carbon inventory because um, they don't include it as part of the national carbon inventory. They include it as an amendment in our pathway to Paris reporting. Um, so it's all a little bit strange there. But in terms of something that we can bring to ground, yes, um, absolutely can explain where this might be a fit where offsets weren't. Um, so in, actually in that last slide, I talked about funding emission reduction outcomes to the logic of the national carbon inventory rather than the logic of an offset. Um, and so if an offset had those rules that I kind of skimmed over earlier about real, additional, permanent, um, we still, at the end of the day, need any of the projects that we put through this um, program to also be long lasting, um, to be um, real, to be provable. Um, but one of the, I think one of the major differences is for offsets, um, they really work best. They're difficult to do for reforestation and restoration, at least in the temperate zone, um, because say with a reforestation project, you spend all of, you have your capital intensive period right at the start where you're doing your planning, you're planting your trees, you're growing your trees, and then you're getting them planted. Um, and then the capital demand on the tail end is not that much. You maybe have to go out and brush them. Um, so like clear out the brush and make sure that they can grow up above the grass or other plants so that they have a statistically a great chance of growing to maturity. Um, this type of thing is is difficult to do with offsets because um, just looking at your sort of the net present value of that work, it's really difficult if you've got a discount rate um, to that investment. And so um, that's hard to do. And it's also hard because with offsets, um, you really only get paid as you issue those offsets. So that's actually the active principle there that um, you get your carbon as it accrues on the landscape and then you can only sell it then where um so that's been a hindrance for for reforestation and restoration through offsets um however with the logic of the national carbon inventory um, and our paris commitments 2030 and 2050 are some of the are the really two key milestones where all of the countries that are signatories to Paris, including Canada, um, have generally been asked to make commitments to emission reductions for those different dates. So we've committed a 30% reduction by 2030, which is nine and a half years from now. And we're basically 0% of the way there, or maybe just a couple. Um, and then by 2050, we committed 80% reduction. And then last year, our federal government said, actually, we're gonna get to net zero. So essentially, summing it out, we're gonna have zero emissions. Um, and so what we hope to see in the Forest Carbon Economy Fund is the ability to make a bit more, a federal government could bit, build a bit more of a portfolio approach where it could say, we want to finance a variety of different forest interactions. So we want to support reforestation. We want to support um, local communities and indigenous communities to be able to have some sway or directly improve the management of their landscape so that there may still be um, forest extraction but that it's being done in a lot cleaner way um, and then also straight up conservation and so um, where you could do something like a reforestation project it's going to have limited impact in year zero and not even that much by 2030 but by 2050 um, if you've got decent growing sites you're starting to get some carbon benefit and so you can see that type of project sort of impact is going to go up over time um, and you may be able to um, thread the needle on funding that project so it would be the government investing kind of more long-term capital um, and getting its return at the end and it could mix that up with other projects um, that are uh, more front-loaded like conservation in an area that was going to get heavily logged and is being protected um, and I'd say improved forest management is kind of in the middle where if you can switch a forest to better management 
every year, it's going to keep having some additional benefit. Um, so time frame is one of one of the things that can distinguish a project that would fit in the forest carbon economy fund. Um, another one is um, sometimes where additionality is a little bit hard. Um, so sometimes rarely people will say, oh yeah, carbon offsets, there's just really no like, they're just fluff, they're not diligently done. Um, and, and having done a bunch of them, I'd say that, that that's not the correct um, assessment. Um, and one of the shortcomings of being so, it's not a shortcoming, just one of the realities of um, having it be so difficult to issue a carbon credit to a high quality standard um, is that sometimes stuff around permanence or additionality is difficult to prove. Um, so you may have a pretty good feeling um, that without this project that landscape was going to have a carbon emission, um, but you may not have the tools to prove it. Um, the government can apply a sort of different lens. Now it's not going to want to invest in things that have no carbon benefit because they're going to be counting on this carbon benefit to 2030 and 2050, um, but there can be sort of a more subjective approach to that. Um, they can also look at projects for their other benefits and say, well, we're going to take a bit of risk on if that carbon actually accrues because of the high social and environmental benefit. Is that helpful? Yeah, uh, really, really great summary. Thank you. It's actually really uh, interesting to learn about. Um, haven't heard about this anywhere yet, but I've been running across the problems that you're talking about in uh, the reading I've been doing. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, you that's awesome that you're running across those problems. And yeah, it's quite cool after 15 years work, you know, 14 years working in the space up to like last year, um, coming across these problems. And I have to, you know, share these problems or say, sorry, your project's not feasible um, to people who want to do these really neat things and it sucks. Um, or having projects fail that you put a lot of work into because of one of these things. And so this change in how Canada is doing its carbon accounting, um, is really exciting to me. I think it's a really good change. And so um, the reason why you wouldn't have heard about it is because we've invented it. <laughs> um, and well, now we're trying to get invented. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can fall under, under the California rules, which I think are similar or maybe even the same as the Canada ones. The only way to make a reforestation project paper is to ultimately uh, uh, turn it into a, like a forestry project and like harvest the lumber. Right, right. Yeah, it's um yeah. There's a a lot of the the California rules are similar to the offset rules here, um, and just sort of the economics of um, payment for performance, which I think is a really good um, discipline to have. I.e., you get paid when the carbon impact happens. I still think, which is what happens with offsets, I think is so valuable because um, I think one of our big risks now with climate is as people. You know, it you can, it's becomes more and more difficult to be a, a climate change denier, um, but there are all sorts of other soft denial, um, either on purpose or not, um, routes or and risks. And then the other is people saying, "Oh yeah, there's some gl climate benefit to what I'm doing, so you should give it a bunch of money." Um, and if it's really effective um, and that money is being spent well to to reduce emissions, that's great. But in a lot of cases it's not and because people don't know it's most people don't have an instinctive take on like what is a ton of carbon dioxide um my organization ecotrust canada just completed its climate smart certification which is a really neat small and medium enterprise um carbon program done by climate smart here in vancouver but delivered across the country um, and it helps walk small and medium enterprises through what are their carb what's their carbon footprint where are their emissions coming from and then can they inspect and find ways to reduce those emissions and our organizational emissions are about 75 tons um, for a group of about 25 people across two offices and then some remote <coughs> with me occasionally flying all over the world um, to talk about this and work on this. Um, so people are like, what, 75 tons? Um, and because, you know, it's hard to know, is this big, is this little? And 75 tons is about the per capita Canadian emission of three people. Um, and, uh, or it's about like seven Ford Tauruses 
driving seven and a half Ford Tauruses driving the average Canadian average of 20,000 kilometers per year. Um, so it's significant, but it's not really, really big. Um, and so having payments be based on emission reduction outcomes achieved is really important. Wow, that was a long tangent. Um, yeah, so yeah, we're building this tool. Um, these are the pieces of the puzzle that I've got up on the screen now. Um, and I'll walk through those. Um, but it's been really awesome to get to do this. We've gotten funding from a variety of players now from the Donner Foundation, from the Metcalf Foundation, um, from Tides Foundation, um, and also from the Canadian Wildlife Service to build out this concept and build some training and communication tools for it. Fundamentally, the way this comes to fruition is that we convince the federal government to uptake it and, and use it either as we've developed it or implement an, an iteration of it in their in their funding. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's a neat task to invent it and then try to make something out of it um, and have that stick. Um, so yeah, this is like the second last slide. Um, just really quickly, the components that we're building in this. Um, there's really three things that we're trying to do. One is build the forest carbon re reporting methodology. Um, and so this is a sort of standard set that allows a project developer, a prospective project developer or community to work through these tools to estimate the carbon impact of implementing their project and then build up the architecture to be able to report and um, audit those impacts so that there's a very clear communication um, of the carbon impact that is created, tons of emission reductions that the federal government can then go on and use. Step number two is a government procurement pathway. So all the standards work is no good if there's no money being used to develop projects. And so we're trying to build uh, a way for government to be able to go out to the market and say, we would like to buy um, 100,000 tons of emission reductions that get delivered over the next 30 years, or we would like to um, spend half a billion dollars per year on this and, and bring your projects to the table and we'll pick the ones we like. Um, we are also building into this um, metrics tools and reporting tools around biodiversity, species at risk and community benefit as well. Um, and so this really broadens the plate, uh, broadens the um, ability for the federal government to select projects on different metrics, including climate, um, which I think is just a good fit for how we see federal government working. Um, and it allows them to communicate the benefit of these projects to a much wider um, set of, of stakeholders um, who may be wanting to see these other things as, as more important than climate. Um, so if you can communicate these things clearly and in a trustworthy way, that just makes it all the more feasible. The last part, going back to this sort of inscrutable geeky part, is how do we actually get these project-based emission reductions um, onto the national climate, climate inventory and, and onto Canada's pathway to Paris? Um, and uh, the answer partly is, is there isn't a tool to do it yet, but it's really neat because this actually syncs up with the work that I'm not planning on going into today, which is the work of the Blockchain for Climate Foundation, um, who is working on putting the Paris Agreement on the blockchain and connecting the national carbon accounts of all the countries of the world. And so um, this is something that I've been working on with a really neat volunteer team of about 20. And um, uh, we realized that that work that we were doing to enable the issuance and exchange of an international sort of Paris compliant carbon credit um, and the architecture that we're working on building on the blockchain to do that uh, could actually be the mechanism that Canada issues an emission reduction outcome from forests on its landscape through the Forest Carbon Economy Fund. Um, and that's necessary because they can't just include so they've done the, the footprint it's around 20 million tons per year of net benefit from the managed forests of Canada um, but they can't just carve out the benefit of these projects that we're talking about developing and put it on there for a variety of accounting rules and and sort of status quo stuff so we need to be creative and so this is sort of the third fun part of our work and then of course 
you know, the small task of convincing the federal government to implement it. Um, so this is sort of what we're, we're hard at work on in the Forest Carbon Economy Fund. And just sort of the end uh, and wrapping up about EcoTrust Canada, um, we're a Canadian charity, we're based in Vancouver, and then we also have the Skeena office up in Prince Rupert. And our recent tagline change is building economies that provide for life. Um, and that next bullet point around um, sort of our four initiatives, the fisheries, community energy, Indigenous homes and housing and climate innovation, of which I'm the director. Um, they're all really focused on increasing and securing control and say over the resources in, in the backyards of rural resource dependent and Indigenous communities. So often we see sort of conglomerates or industrialization um, or aggregations of finance really getting the majority of the benefit of, of natural resources. And we're trying to shift that um, back and put that power, more power and control in the hands of the people that live in these spaces, um, either for continuing resource extraction the way they were and getting more money, or especially in the climate innovation space, to allow them to manifest their goals and priorities of having a clean, um, a clean landscape, better management of their lands, protection where appropriate, um, and then still having an economic reality, be that just from the carbon credits or from a mixing of carbon credits and other resource extraction. Um, uh, the team, um, largely me and some other folks have been using carbon offsets to develop projects for the last 16 years now. Um, and so this is why we're a really big proponent of, of this pathway because we've got to see it do really amazing projects and have really great outcomes. Um, and uh, something that really underpins our work is seeking to help Indigenous communities use these new climate finance tools to achieve their community priorities um, and undertake their land management goals. And so it's been a real delight to speak with you. Totally open for questions. Um, we have a nice new website up with a new salmon pink um, uh, theme at ecotrust.ca. It says a bit about our work there. Um, and you can find me and Ecotrust Canada on Twitter. Thanks so much.